And welcome to full current. As they say, no behalf current. Now waiting. Now, now full, full current. current. Now imagine God gave us light. And this light he gave us is half current. This light cannot charge your life. It cannot charge your finances. It cannot charge your marriage. It cannot do anything. Full current conversations about how we can maximize the gift of God, how we can maximize our faith with practical conversations, tough conversations, and things that will push our lives to the fullest current. On the first episode of this phenomenal podcast show, I have a person that I rate so highly and dearly. He's close to me. Please put your hands together for the great Dr. Cosmos Maduka. So guys. Um, his humility is real. He's not faking humility. He's, he's actually a very humble man. Sir, how are you doing? I'm doing great. No. So the idea is that at some point, Aboyeji will join us. He's caught up in traffic. But um, the idea is also to bring the old generation and the new generation to yeah. have conversation. Yeah. So the first question I want to just ask, first of all, is um, in your journey to wealth, was it hard work? Or was it a gift from God? Um, let me start first this discussion coming back behind what you have just uh, illustrated about current. Yeah. Because it's important that we all get clear information that we are all generating electricity, the way we are formed and made. Um, you can't do anything without current, and I'm happy to be invited to discuss today on the subject of full current. <laughs> yes. Um, I think it was uh, Nikola Tesla that says, if you want to find the secret of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Every one of us are vibrating being, and we attract what we signal we send out there. As we stand here and have made this discussion, signals are passing through this room from thoughts people like you and me are putting out there. And what comes to you, what you attract, is this, the desire, the same thing that you are in that will help you download such other current. There are some that will repel and go away because there's nothing to reflect them in you. But based on what you are putting out there, you are catching some other current. And that is why it's important you understand the secret of life about your thinking process, how things happen in your life start from the way you think. You ask a question, um, was wealth given to you, or, or was it hard work? It's a combination of both of them. You cannot take gift away from hard work. But really, hard work, because if you put it totally on hard work, you are saying there's no place in it for God. But I can tell you, it's like when some guys ask me to explain about destiny. Destiny is a fun thing today. Everybody wants to talk about destiny. Or and, yeah, some people now can sit back and say, well, I am destiny to be poor. <laughs> you know, I can't do anything. The way I try to explain destiny is like your father having money to pay for your school fees and you want to read medicine. If you, if your father have the money to pay for your school fees and take you to school, you are destined to be a doctor. But whether you become a doctor or not at the end of the day will be up to you because your father can pay your school fees and you get into college and you meet a lot of learning gates in this college and you start fooling around jumping up and down at the end of the year you are not going to graduate you are, you won't say you are not destined to become a doctor but you refuse to be so and that's why when people go to church and sing those songs Destiny changer, come and change my destiny. When they get there, I keep quiet because I love my destiny. 
<laughs> I don't want it to be changed. I, I control it. I decide what it will be. That power is given to you. So it's a combination of gift and hard work. Where is the place of hard work? Go back to Genesis 2. Uh, God made the man. Actually, God, um, God's motivation of, crea of creation was to get a manager. Genesis 2 4 says the earth was blank, nothing moved, nothing happened, no beauty. It was just rock and anything. It didn't even rain until God brought man on the earth. Because he's looking for somebody to manage his resources. God is looking for a manager. So the place of hard work, when eventually made that done, Genesis 2, 14, he put him in the garden of Eden to protect it and to dress it. That means to walk. That's what it is all about. So you can't take a place of work out of it and you cannot take the gift of God in our lives out of it. So, so just to push further in this conversation, most people here that are watching this show are Christian or have Christian concepts. Yeah. They do. The Bible says that everything in us has been given for life. And so that means everything about our greatness is in us. But not everybody is expressing that. Not everybody is living to the fullest. How did you find and bring out the best in you? Was it mentorship? Was it, was it, was, was it the, the, the pressure of, of childhood? Why? Because most people need to know that they also have a chance to become full. Okay, let me put it in this way. Um, everything about life, you don't need to read Bible, frankly speaking, to know God. Nature teaches you about God. Everything about life, nature is express God in real life. Of course, we are Christians, so we read Bible. But even before Bible, Abraham didn't read no Bible. You know, look at people in the Old Testament. But they walk instinctively because God created a man. And when he wanted to make a man, he didn't, it was not a subjection. It was not something he was gazing at. The intention and purpose was clear. Let me create a being that will be in my own likeness, that will be able to be me in the physical. So man was made to be God on the earth. Um, if you talk about myself, I will simply say that my mother was a great tool in the hand of God in my life because she inspired me to greatness. But it's not only what my mother told me that matter, but the state of my mind as a kid. I grew up being inquisitive. I craved for knowledge. I wanted to know. In fact, the more people tell me to keep quiet, the more I ask questions. Because there's something in me calling for knowledge to know. But my mother looked me straight into my eyes after the death of my father at the tender age of four and asked me to believe in myself as I believe in God. That's why I said they all both work together. So I grew up with optimism, believing that no door closed before me. Because nobody is going to believe in you if you do not believe in yourself. It's a personal revelation of who you are. I had nothing when I believe I will be successful. And nobody can talk me out of it. So that optimism was one of the things that really for life. So I grew up in that same knowledge, seeking to know God, trying to find God, trying to, you know, develop the inspiration that, it, that I so, that's supposed to give me leading to life. God met a man, and after making man in Genesis 1, 20, he said he, that is very good. It's not that is good, very good. 
In other words, everything we require to be successful in life is in us. Many of us look outside. We never look inward. I totally believe in that word that everything you require in terms of life and godliness, God deposited in you. But you need to find the key. And what do I mean by finding the key? If you are coming into this building and I give you the bunch of this, the, the bunch of key of this building, maybe there are 50 keys. You can stay in this one door for two hours without finding the right key. In fact, sometimes you put the right key on it, but because you didn't know it's the right key, you check it, it makes more resistance. You start going through all the other keys around again, and you can be here for three hours. But man, if you have the right key, you get at this door, you put it. If it doesn't open, you, you check, you put some, you apply some pressure because you know you have the right key. And the next thing is that this door is going to open. Because you are not gazing, you have the right key. So Jesus said, I give you the keys. He didn't say one single key. Keys of the kingdom of God. These keys are principles. Principles are law. This law are not to be written. It's already written. You can argue. You can force. You can speak grammar. Principle never argue with you. He never reply you. But you need to follow it to succeed. If you violate it, you pay for it. It works in Japan. It works in Nigeria. It works in India. It works in Canada. It works anywhere in the world. It doesn't know whether your skin is yellow, brown, or white, whatever you call it. If you follow the same principle, you get the result. If you violate it, you pay. So you are saying that these principles also work for non-believers? Works for non-believers. Work for believers. Many times, believers talk about it, but they are not in sync with it because they are, they are, they are, their expectation like i said whatever you put out there to the universe you attract into you if you put out correction your belief and your your you are in alignment with your your emotion and the belief both of them come to alignment then you will see it, the universe will see this is what you require for. It will drop it into you and you will see it happen. It works for anybody. It's a law. It doesn't respect Christians, unbelievers, Hindus, Buddhists, it can come. It, it goes beyond the boundary of any religion. And that's where many people make mistakes because uh, people go to church and think because they pray will make them wealth. And you, sometimes you go to motivational talk and they tell you say I am rich I am rich five times you say I am rich I'm rich five times and you still as poor as you are because the words I'm rich does not create you wealth you have one thing it it, it it there are principle other principle that has to come in line and they are in alignment for it to work I have I have been in personal conversations around you okay I've, I've seen you talk about how you lost this how you lost that we're in an era now that is fear in the air the fuel, fuel price is enormous someone said that fuel and dollar and now we're trying to get to 1000 naira first it's tough someone said that fear steals from your internal government how by experience have you dealt with fear You've lost some things, you've made risks, you've, you, you, you've put your hand in some fire. How will you tell the young ones to deal with fear? Okay, let me say that because this is a very important uh, subject, the question that you have asked. Man was not made to fear originally. Fear is something you learn as you grow up. Get a little baby who is like the way God wants you to live. Babies no, no, knows only two fear. Fear of noise and fear of being dropped. 
you see your baby can climb up to the stair, like stay in the balcony, want to jump up the floor. He's not afraid of he's going to die. You look at the baby who put his fingers into electric socket. He's not afraid that the electric is going to shock him. You look at the baby, um, a serpent comes here. The baby will grab the serpent and bite the serpent. It's the serpent that will run or become afraid. That is the age of Meranium, where you believe everything is possible. You tell that baby, I will buy you a aeroplane tomorrow. As you are coming back, say, Daddy, where's the aeroplane? So he believes everything you tell him. This is the way we are supposed to live. But by the time you start getting to age of nine, I said, be careful, you will fall, you will do this, and you start learning fear. So fear is acquired. So the first thing you need to fight in your life is fear. And I'll tell you a story. When I was a, a kid, I was a, a, at the age of, you know, adolescent age. One man came to our house that time. I was a little sick. He took my hand and looked. Oh, and I told my, my grandmother, I said that, uh, this boy is Obanje, you know, that I came from spirit and that uh, I'm, I'm going to die or something like that. And my grandmother said that to me, and fear perplexed me. I go to the stream. I cannot get to the stream to fetch water because I've been told that when I get to the stream, I will disappear. So I stand at the edge of the stream waiting for somebody to fetch water for me. But... I lived that life of fear until I became about 14 when I met the person of Jesus Christ in his saving grace. On my honor, by 12 midnight, I went to the stream between the Newe and Opo. We, we call it uh, we, the, 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 between the Newe and Opo. On top of the bridge, I jumped inside that stream. I said, where is the Mabe water? He should come out. He should come and catch me. That was how I destroyed that fear once and for all in my life. But before then, I was in bondage and I'm scared that I enter water, I will disappear. So fear is something people learn. God, man is not made to fear. Therefore, you can make success in full form in life if your life is captivated because fear creates you stress. Fear creates cancer. There's diseases that come from, from fear. So fear, you should make fear fear. <laughs> you should make fear be afraid of you. Because you are not a physical being. You are a spiritual being living in a physical world. So you need to, when this knowledge of who you are, which is what the word of God does to believers, if you are willing to really go into it and search out, because every secret by which everything operates are laid down in the word of God. So if you call it lucky, I'm lucky that at very tender age of 14, I met the person of Jesus Christ saving grace and that revolutionized my life. There are many things I knew and I started working with these principles and I'm able to take control of my life knowing that my destiny, the, in fact if I ask you to help me and you are hesitant, I tell you, you better help me so that you can share from my progress. <laughs> if you say no, I tell you forget it, you will regret that you didn't assist me. And when you say things like this to somebody, he thinks you are mad. What's, what gives you this kind of confidence to say that? Because I never believe you are, you are God to me. As much as I need your help, I just believe God is going to use you to do something. And, and as many as didn't, my uncle gave me 200 naira in 1976. My senior brother that went with me said, I should leave it and let us go. I told my asked him, I said, do you have anyone to give me when we get home? <laughs> he says, no. So I said, why are you asking me to leave this? These are principles. Do not forget the beginning of a small thing. Yes. I never looked at 200 naira because I could go to a restaurant that evening and eat goat head with it. 
and I will still blame everybody around me, including God, for taking my father when I was four years. But I confused my uncle. Ask my senior brother if you read my book from trial to trump. I told my uncle, you didn't count the money well. He said, what do you mean? I said, you gave me 2,000 naira. I had 200 naira. I said, you gave me 2,000 naira. I said, uncle, if God had in your heart to do this, after I worked for you for six years plus, your reward for my six years apprenticeship was 200 naira. Five years from today, if you had who I am, your, your head would be spinning. It shook him. There are things 15 years boys don't say. It shook him. He told I said, well, I know, I know you will be successful. I said, thank you very much. That's what I can take from you. And I left. Team up with my senior brother with 200 naira, and we formed a company called Madeka Brothers. But I'm driven by this principle. It wasn't long we started differing in ideology. My senior brother is still alive today. Ambassador um, Odom, William Odom, you know, went to Newi to interview him when he was writing my book. He told him, what was our, why did we separate? I go to church, I made offering of one naira. My brother told me I cannot be taking one naira out of our meager capital to make offering. That in Catholic, they give 10 common. I said, sorry, that, that's not the issue. You drank beer, I drink Coca-Cola. The offering I give <laughs> compensate for the beer you drank. <laughs> Daddy, so we're going to break now. Okay. And in two minutes, we, we return. It's full, it's full current. Thank you very much. So I, I started to pray. And God led me to a passage of scripture. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 30, it says, Even young people will be weak and frail, and they will be tired out of exhaustion. I'm paraphrasing it. But they that wait on the Lord, those that put their trust in God, shall renew their strength. They will rise up like wings, um, with wings like eagles. They shall run, they shall not be worried, uh, weary, they shall uh, walk, and they shall not faint. And for me, that verse was my deliverance because I realized that if the Bible can say, even if you are young, your strength is not enough to carry you into God's purpose for your life, then, you know, after all, young people are not children. They are not children. Uh, they are not uh, old people that you can say, oh, that they might be weak and frail. So I think hustle... Uh, is a is a is a demon. <laughs> um, it is something that we require deliverance from. Now, it does not mean you should not be diligent. It doesn't mean you should you shouldn't work hard. But I think hustle comes from struggle, struggling with God. Um, the the last uh, Jacob hustled, <laughs> eh? and God had to break his leg for him to understand the futility of hustle. So I see a lot of people hustling. How can I make it? How can I try? And many times they are not inquiring of God. What is God's purpose for my life? Is this what you have created me to do? And that is why they will continue to struggle. But the moment, I mean, 10 years um, and what we have been able to accomplish by the grace of God, I continue to say it, that anybody that tries to Ask me, oh, what did you do? How did you do it? I said, look, no man can do these things unless God is with them. And that has been my testimony for the last 10 years. It's not possible to do the things that I've done if God does not help you. But you have to be in his plan and purpose for your life. Thank you. So, so, so just to marry it to you, sir, um, when did you know what you were called to do on earth? Or, let me paraphrase, if you were in another country, another, another country, would you still be successful doing what you're doing? Yes, um, and let me answer that question very clear. Um, today, a lot of young people 
are doing everything they can to get out of this country. <clears throat> I'm not saying this country is the best place to be in, in the universe. But every problem is a business. Every challenge is an opportunity. <laughs> um, I worked hard with 200 Naira in 1976. By 1980, I already started traveling abroad. I made my first trip to the United States of America when I was about 20. That was 1980. And I arrived in America. Everybody did everything to convince me to stay back. People didn't start abusing this country now. <laughs> <laughs> You are not the first to jack up. <laughs> when, when one naira was two dollars, people are already running away from this country and tell you that it's useless. There's nothing on it. And everybody did everything to talk me back to stay in America. I asked them one question. I said, what did you have that makes you think this is the best place to be? And I'll be honest to say, by that time, I do not have hundred thousand naira because I use five hundred and seventy naira to buy one thousand dollars in ninety seven yeah one naira is like two dollar it's still in my passport five hundred and seventy naira at first bank equals to one thousand US dollar. Wow that time you can take your naira you don't even need to go to any bank if you arrive in New York you change it at uh, at the Brewery Exchange. They take it in uh, UK, anywhere in the world. Naira was powerful, Nigerians were respected. But at this point in time, everybody tried to convince me to stay. I said, look, I'm going back to Nigeria. You see, it's a tough place. The same thing he did, he came back to this country against his parents' permission. 90% of the time, we parents are the dream killers of our children's dream. We stop them. But my mother that inspired me to greatness, get to a point I fought her. Because when I wrote five things I wanted to do before 25, to live in three bedrooms apartment of my own by 18, to have a wife by 20, and have a son by 21, and have a car by 23 and be a millionaire by 25. I accomplished the first one by eight, 18 years. I was living in three bedrooms apartment of my own, not my parents' house. And I started looking for a wife. I took my wife to, to altar on September 23rd, 1978. I would turn 20 on December 24 that year. I got married on that 20. I made love to my wife. I wanted a baby at 21. The baby didn't come because it's not my business. That is God's business. <laughs> because this, these two babies cannot be producing babies. So he closed the womb. <laughs> so give us a chance to get to know ourselves. I pursued the other dream. By 22, I bought a Passat Volkswagen wagon. You can see blue color. You see me with my bongo trouser and four decker heel on it. Then the next thing is to be a millionaire. My wife was in the front of the car. My mother was behind. We are traveling somewhere. When these things come upon me, inspiration is not something they taught you in school. Untaught knowledge. Some people call it intuition comes upon me. I said, time is running out on me. Two more years. I have to be a millionaire. My mother said, please, please, please. I said, oh, what's the problem? He said, this is your boat. Turn my story. <laughs> Let's go this journey in peace. I said, mom, everything I am, you told me I can go places in life. I believe you. Why are you trying to? He said, he's tired of this, my boasting. I don't have 50,000 naira. I'm talking about <laughs> million. You know, that this million, 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 I should stop it. I stopped the car, wind the glass down, get close to my, mo my mother's ear, and said, two more years, I will be a millionaire. You want to get down? My mother was a strong voice. Of course, I opened the car. My wife said, are you crazy? That's your mother. 
I banged the door. I said, if you like, you get down. I drop you also. I drove away. I met my first $1 million at 24 years, not 25. And the rest is history. So, that's why I'm saying you got to believe in yourself. When nobody believed in you, Joseph saw a vision, shared it with his parents, with his brethren. If you never, if you never speak it, you didn't believe it. If you are afraid of controversy, don't, for fear of controversy, deny your experience. You must be willing to be misunderstood. Talk about missing road. You will never find new road without missing road. When you miss road, you discover another road. You may discover that that is a dead point. There's no road there. So you will not go there again. At the age of 14 to 21 is where you need to make mistake. Really go out there to express yourself. I scramble on top of motorcycle, start on the seat, and left my two hands <laughs> up. People say, this guy wants to commit suicide. <laughs> I come on the bend the corner, I drop the exhaust. If he didn't crack fire, I wouldn't take it off. There's something in me trying to actualize itself. This is the time you have to make those mistakes. The point I'm making is that if your parents wanted to protect you, if you have listened to them, they will be sending you pocket money. Yes. And by 28, 30, they tell you you are a useless boy. You will become a liability. But they make you a liability. Mm. You need to allow people to discover themselves. Mistake, are they going to make it? Of course. That's my granddaughter there. When she was cramming to, to get to work, I never sit down and be taking a beak and say, hey, you fell today, one. You fell yesterday, two. You fell today, three. Falling is a process of learning to walk. Yes, and if you think, if she says, I don't want anybody to laugh at me, I will sit on this floor. The day my leg is strong, I'll get up. It will be a <laughs> learned person. It will never walk. You learn to walk by falling. So, so you have to make those mistakes. My excitement is the effort is making, I'll just put my left hand, it will hold it and be moving like a breeze is blowing her. <laughs> but within one year, her foot is strong on the ground. The more she does it, practice makes perfect, it gets stronger. You need to understand how life operates because that is really where our problem is. We are spiritual, we are, we are, we are not a physical being, we are spiritual beings living in a physical world. We are sending out vibrations, vibrations in our thoughts every day in the things we are doing. You are a vibratic, you are, you are, you are, you vibrate in the way you live and this universe also vibrate. So signals are coming across you and passing and going and come. What you send out there is what you will attract. Therefore, you must be willing that you will achieve and you go out there with that determination. When you are in sync with what you want to do, there's nothing that can stop it not to happen. That's why the Bible says all things are possible to them that believe. Before we go on a break, in one question. You always keep a humble demeanor. So is humility wisdom for you or is just you don't want attention? You don't want, is humility why is humility a thing for you? And <laughs> well, you see, uh, when, not, because if some boys have this money, you have. <laughs> well, that's the problem. I don't have the money. <laughs> <laughs> it's Jesus that has the money. <laughs> the thing is this, right? Um, my perspective of life is that uh, I, I, it is not I that lives but Christ who lives in me. So I'm not, I can't be, be boastful because I know in my heart of hearts that it's not me that is doing these things. And I know that it is, it is Christ that I carry that is doing these things. So I'm just grateful that I am a vessel for God's work. Uh, so it's not possible for me to now take uh, credits for those things. So me, and for me, what I want to do with my life is just to carry Christ about. 
carry Christ to the but, marketplace. But practically, yes. and this is for you, how do you guys submit yourself, like put your, your, uh, see your flesh down or just put yes, yourself yes. down because you, you, you have access to wealth, you have, how do you put yourself on that subjection? It's a, it's a daily work, you know, um, the, 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 the Bible says, I die daily, right? So for me, I wake up in the morning and I remind myself, in Yolu Aboyeji, you died. <laughs> and today, Christ wants to go, where does, where does Jesus want to go wow. today? And this is just the character of Christ. It's not that I cannot, once in a while, right, pride will enter. People will provoke you. <laughs> you want to remind them that, ah, uh kilo -uh, day. <laughs> but the moment that you are conscious of the fact that you are carrying Christ, right, um, the character of Jesus is that he, he was God himself. Not just the Son of God, he was God himself. And he took a human form. And that is, that is the work that he did on the cross for everybody. It's not just Christ that, needs to, that, that is having that experience. It is Christ in us that is having that experience. So I have a lot of... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful. Um, and that is what you see. It's not that I'm being humble. But I'm being grateful that... I am a vessel for Christ's work in the marketplace. And I know that it is not that I did something special, particularly. It is that by the mercies of God, I have been given that privilege to carry Christ so that he can shine through the world. So it means, it allows me a certain level of level-headedness. I, I sent you a mail about this event about a month ago, and I saw that you were on a spiritual retreat for, I think, for a week. For 10 days. For 10 days. Yeah. Sir, how do you also keep yourself in check? Because let's not deny, sometimes billions can make you, or does it not? Let me add to the answer he gave you from the question you asked. You sent me a question. Is pride beginning of wisdom? It's humility. It's humility. Beginning of wisdom. Beginning of wisdom. Um, and they are simply said, and I think that's not, the question is that is humility, wisdom. wisdom. But if you want to know, my own answer is that it's the beginning of wisdom. Humility. It's, humility is the beginning of wisdom. Um, for myself, I do tell people that I am a Christian who became rich. I am not a rich man who became a Christian. And there are two big contracts between both of them. When you are a rich man who becomes a Christian, you condescend to other Christians. Look down on them because they have not achieved what you achieve. And you, you try to size them up. That's it many, the way some people carry themselves. It's like they tolerate one another. But there's no money in heaven. There's no rich man or poor man in heaven. If you want to go to this heaven, you start to learn the communion living here on earth, watching other people's feet and wow. being one another. So that understanding, Jesus himself being God, humbled himself and became lesser than the angel and a man. And Bible says he learned obedience through the things he suffered. So God himself allowed his son to go through tutoring by letting him take pains. And then in Matthew 11, 7, he adopted him, take him to Mount Transfiguration and put, make a sign and put a robe on him and say from today, I don't speak. Whatever my son says is good as the father's name on the check. But before then, he went through tutoring, child training. That's why when you claim you're a Christian, you can't be a Christian with your mouth alone. That's why I tell you, they, you go, they, te they teach you, uh, um, you know, positive uh, talk. Say, I am rich, I am rich <laughs> five times. You say, I am rich, I am rich five times. You are still as poor as anything because what doesn't make you rich. 
you need to go through child tutoring in growing up. Jesus was tempted by his flesh, by his appetite. So, you think you you if you want to preach this gospel, your your appetite test is going to be put to test. Your sex appetite, your food appetite. These are not popular gospel, but I'm teaching, telling you the principles that make this thing happen. Your pride has to be put to test. Remember this three wise attack, which is in First John chapter one verse six: Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that are in the world are the loss of the flesh, the loss of the the, the, the loss of the flesh, the pride of the the, the, lo the loss of the, the the eyes and the pride of life. The the pride of the loss of the eye. The loss of the flesh and pride of life, which is money, woman, and popularity. Those three things are things we are going to go through the test of all of them. Many of us want to preach with our zip open. We need to zip up if we really mean we are, we are going any, anywhere. Okay? Then our appetite of food has also to be tested. We just see food, we get loose. You have reason to fast for two. For some people say that I've been fasting uh, six to twelve. What does that mean? You miss, <laughs> you miss one meal, you call it a fast. So you need to bring your body into subjection. You know, you, you can't make omelette without breaking an egg. So these are principles. And that's why I said that there are keys to the kingdom. It's not one single key. If you have one key, you need to get the other key so that you unlock all the other doors and then you can move freely. So we'll take a break. So no break. Now, we would have you ask questions, but I want to ask something a bit tougher now, and it's the two of you. Sure. In your lifetime, what obstacle have you faced that almost shook you away from focus. What have you gone through and how did you go through it? Because focus is capacity, focus is capital. Give, give us a life case study of something that almost took you away from focus and how you go back to it. Please see. Um, man, I, you know, the truth is I've had many of such scenarios in my life. I almost feel like um, whenever God wants to draw my attention uh, back to him, he finds a way to frustrate, to frustrate me. Um, so I can give you stories from 2014, 2016, 2019. Um, but maybe I will share the last one, you know, okay. uh, which is more recent, so that you know that uh, this life is not uh, happily ever after. <laughs> it's died daily. <laughs> That's our own version of, <laughs> of happily ever after as Christians. Um, so last, last year in, in July, last year, I, um, I was at the top of my game. We had just designed a new kind of investing, uh, club investing. People would put their money together. Everything is great. And so I thought the next step for us, we had raised $10 million doing that, mostly from Nigerians. We had 100 portfolio companies. We had done very well. So the next step was, oh, Obviously, now, God wants me to progress. So I'm going to 100 million. And um, everything was perfect. I had some very big investors in the Middle East I was talking to. We had a war, an Africa tour. We had planned a road show. You know, everything was going fantastic. Um, and then, you know, one day I woke up in the morning in Dubai. And my name was trending on Twitter. <laughs> my name is trending on Twitter. Okay, well, Twitter people, they like to create controversy. So I ignored it. Then my team started to reach out to say, are you okay? I said, okay, that was. What happened? I said, ah, that somebody wrote an article. I said, eh, huh? what is the article? I read it. It didn't really reference me. At all, because I heard that. It was not my business. And he said, no, that um, somehow the narrative on Twitter versus the article was that 
I was the one that did one of, like, uh, did committed fraud or did something. I said, ah. that I went to SEC, which is a very serious thing in my business because I was about to go and fundraise, that I went to SEC and I lied to SEC about something. So immediately, I just called um, the guy who was managing compliance for us to tell him that, look, this issue is on the horizon, but I'm sure it's something that we can sort out. I minimized it completely. And I just continued my roadshow. So I went into a room with investors, and I finished doing my fantastic presentation about how we will use $100 million to change the world. Questions started to come in, and I started to get these very annoying questions about things I didn't know anything about. At the end of the day, it became clear that the controversy had overtaken the fundraise, and that was how the whole fundraise went away. So I was now like, okay, <laughs> now you have my attention. <laughs> so as things went on, I, I just shut off and I went uh, into a place of prayer. I, that was when I started to go to, to Boko for Lederio. I, it's, a, it's a spiritual leadership program. So I went with Billy. Yeah, with Brazil. So I went there and I was just like, you know, son, I was having a quiet time. Every day you have a quiet time. And I had a quiet time. I said, son, I needed to speak to you urgently. Um, and there, you know, God gave me a series of instructions and some of them were very impossible so for example i will share one you know because of the platform we are on god said i know that every company you've built you've had to build with shareholders but this time it's just me and you so i had to figure out a way to restructure my business and work with the old investors it, it was very painful one year not raising money, and honestly, I had to, you know, I, I was so frustrated the first month because I've never owed salary in my life, because I never have to worry about it. I want to raise money, I make a few phone calls, money shows up. For the first time, I was, it was two days to payroll and there was an empty bank account. So I called an older friend of mine and I said, how, how do you do this thing? And he said, trust God for your daily needs. Wow. He said, as everybody is expecting their salary, if you said that God told you he wants to be your shareholder, you too be expecting your salary. I said, Which kind, what kind of madness is this? But I just, I just said, God, if this thing is true, you, I need to, I'm trusting you now. And we are talking about people's families, you know, all sorts. And you know what? That day, I, as, I don't know how God does it, but we planned a retreat the week that salary was supposed to be paid in Kenya. The last money we had, we used it to bring it into the So this was not a case of you can run away or stop <laughs> answering calls. Everybody is watching you in 3D. So if you don't pay, we have retreats. If people are not seeing a lot. They can come to you directly and hold your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? That day, we got an alert of the exact amount. Wow. Wow. So I asked my partner, where did you see this money? She said, ah, that, well, there was one money we saw from here, but that there was this particular money that came from fees that we had earned or something, something, and that money is exactly the amount we need for the salaries. Mm. And I'm telling you, from that time till now, I have not raised any money, I don't. I mean, our money that we, we manage money now, we don't have investors in our own management company. We just, it's just us and God. And he, God has been faithful every month. So what I have learned from the way God works is every time he wants to raise you into a different level of relationship with him, sometimes he may need to call your attention by pulling down what you planned. We didn't do the $100 million fund, um, but we are, we are trusting God for half the amount. And, but you know what God did? And that's another testimony. One check, one check from one investor 
that we're given to manage was greater than the entire previous fund wow. that I was boasting about. One check from one investor. We had managed $10 million. I have one $10 million investor in, in my fund. Wow. And that just shows you how God works. So um, these days, when I face challenges, uh, the level, and I'm still hoping to go higher, the level I'm at with God now is, thank you. <laughs> Which surprise <laughs> are we going to go on today? Because and till tomorrow, I just trust God for our daily, our daily, our daily needs. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for today's one hour we're done. We're done, but um, I would ask one question that is not on camera, that is just for him, just to talk about your, because this is for the, for the YouTube. What has been that one obstacle that almost took you away and you survived? One of my greatest obstacles, I have had a lot of them. I believe, like, uh, I, after so many things I, I have gone through in life, I started being very observant, and which is very important for every one of you. You need to observe your life so that you can track events. Every seven years of my life, since I was born, something will happen to me. Like this is the end. You will never go beyond this point. The first seven years was my father dying when I was four. I was a kid. I didn't do anything. So that took away formal education for me. The second seven years was after working for my uncle for six years, and I got 200 naira. The next seven years was at 21 years. The boys working for me went to UC Alangba, and they did 419 to them. 56 traders sued me under vicarious liability. I had to be, I hired about every, I have, sometimes I have 50 cases in different courts in one day. <laughs> to, get, <laughs> to get to this place where we are, it doesn't come overnight. If I tell you all these stories, you will, you just said, simple, leave it. Anyway, let me cut it short. The, the highest of them was in 2011, where I have a kid brother of mine to finance something for $300 million, and uh, the thing go bust. And uh, I was left with a liability of over $21 billion on $300 million interest on a monthly basis. But I survived it. <laughs> so that's most of that's, that's, I've, I've gone through things, and here am I. Please, please. Thank you so much. I can't. I, I don't know how to end it. You survived. Wow. Thank you so much for full current. Thank you for thank you for joining in. Um, we will rerun this twice and guess the next guest. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Thank you.